Greetings folks, my name is Ron Weiskanji, and welcome to Quick and Dirty Roleplaying. In this episode, I want to talk about my history with Mutants and Masterminds, a superhero RPG designed by Steve Kenson and published by Green Running Publishing. Back in the year 2000, uh, the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons was released. I've been following the development of D&D 3rd edition closely uh, ever since the new edition of the game was announced. Uh, the various unique sub-traits of each ability, like bend bars slash lift gates and maximum number of followers, were omitted and in their place was simply a modifier. Skills and skill points were available to all characters, not just thieves. Thaco was replaced with base attack bonus, and armor class went up instead of down. Uh, those wonky saving throws from the previous editions were replaced by more by the more intuitive fortitude, reflex, and will saves. And feats. What the heck were those? Uh, this stuff was breathing life into a game that I've been frustrated with for a while and had abandoned in place for other systems that allowed for greater customizability or customization. Uh, like Fusion, uh, World of Darkness, and Shadowrun. Uh, I purchased the three core books for D&D 3rd Edition for $20 a pop. Ugh, those were the days. And devoured the material. It just seemed right that monsters were built just like characters, and I really admired at what I perceived to be a level of logical consistency that was absent in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, my first exposure to D&D, and the earliest edition I played. I was freaking inspired. Yeah, it still had levels and armor making you harder to hit instead of harder to hurt, but the game system it used, the D20 system, was just ripe for hacking. I was under the impression that each of the character classes in this game were balanced and that there was a method to the madness that determined what each trait of a character was worth. A plus one ability modifier was worth more than one skill rank. Some abilities affected more dice rolls than others, and so some abilities seemed to be worth more than others. Strength, for example, affected melee attack rolls, strength checks, strength-based damage rolls, weight capacity, and very few skill rolls. Charisma, on the other hand, affected social skill checks, arcane spell save DCs for bards and sorcerers, the number of bonus spells a bard or sorcerer could know, and the highest level spell a bard or sorcerer could cast. So in that sense, unless you're a bard or sorcerer, charisma seems to be worth a lot less than strength in Dungeons and Dragons, a game that has a heavy focus on combat. And feats, they seem to be worth all the same. And the thing that justified more powerful feats were the requirements needed to acquire them. There was a lot of stuff to consider, and I was determined to find out what the magic formula for all this stuff was. I even delved into other RPGs that Wizards of the Coast developed during the D&D 3rd edition era. There were three Star Wars RPGs, uh, the Wheel of Time RPG, um, D20 Modern. Each game was built on the same uh, game system, but tweaked in their own way. I was convinced that they were balanced using the same magic formula they had deduced in the development of D&D 3rd edition, the process, and that the process was kept tightly hidden from the public so that their consumers had to rely on them to produce more and more content that was considered legit and not janky like the plethora of games that used the D20 license at the time during the early and mid 2000s. Uh, during that process of reverse engineering the D20 system so that I can make a coherent universal D20 system, one product emerged from the hundreds that caught my attention. Well, yeah, from the hundreds. Jeez, how do I phrase this? Because the hundreds did not catch my attention. So it's more like among the hundreds that emerged, one of them caught my attention. Sorry, I'm just reading this off a script. So, like no other. Mutants and Masterminds. If I recall correctly, Guardians of, Guardians of Order had also created a superhero RPG under the D20 license, 
and its own proprietary system, Tristat, around that time or earlier called Silver Age Sentinels. I saw both versions as flawed, but for the sake of this discussion, what put me off of the D20 version of Silver Age Sentinels was that it was a class and level system, just like D&D. I wanted to move away from that, as I did during my time playing AD&D 2nd Edition. One of the first revelations it presented to me, Mutants and Masterminds that is, was that it didn't use hit points or various polyhedrals for damage dice. Instead, when a character got hit by a damaging attack, they would make a damage save, which is affected by their constitution modifier and any power that would act as armor. The base target number to shrug off an attack was set pretty high at 15, and the attack's damage modifier stacked on top of that. If a target failed their damage save, the effect they suffered depended on how badly they failed, and it was done in increments of 5. So barely failing only meant that the target got a hit, which was a um, minus 1 penalty to future damage saves and these stacked. So if you had like three hits in your character and they needed to make a damage save, then they would take a minus three on that roll. While failing by more than 10 left you staggered, a condition that only let you perform either a move or a standard action each round. And getting staggered a second time would take you out of the fight. This damage mechanic was something that I really, really dug on paper. It meant that any attack could potentially take someone out of the fight with one hit. It also meant that a character could conceivably survive attacks that would normally obliterate a D&D creature of equal power based on average damage rolls. The swinginess of it all was dangerous and exciting. I also learned that Mutants and Masterminds didn't have classes or levels, at least not levels in the traditional sense. A character's level simply determine how many power points they would get for their character build budget as well as limit how high you can pump up some uh, specific traits. I was overjoyed when I got my hands on a copy of the first edition of Mutants and Masterminds. Even though it seemed a bit thin at the time, I found it to be jam-packed with more value than say D20 Modern, which I was also excited for at the time, what with ability-based classes. D20 Modern was thicker than any of the D&D 3rd Edition core books, but that's because it encompassed everything it needed all in one book. But so did Mutants and Masterminds. I came to the conclusion that the thickness of D20 game books like D20 Modern and Star Wars D20 was that it, would, it needed those extra pages for all the base classes, prestige classes, and NPC creatures that you can encounter in those settings. With Mutants and Masterminds, however, everything was made on a budget of points and you just needed to figure out how to translate a character or a creature concept into ability scores, feats, and powers to make anything you wanted. Anything. I love that kind of freedom in game design. The class and level systems of D&D any edition always felt so restrictive to me and it was the same with other D20 system games that followed the same formula. Hell, Mutants and Masterminds even did away with the vast majority of feat prerequisites found in other D20 games and also repurposed a good number of feats so you can take them multiple times to have a more powerful version of them. So with that being said, stay tuned for the next episode where I continue with my history with Mutants and Masterminds from trying to convince my friend group at the time to play this with me as well as the emergence of the second edition and my favorite Mutants and Masterminds supplements. Take care, folks, and play to find out what happens.